Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to um, today's 40 Top Virtual Series on West Virginia Gardening, Farmers Market, and Agriculture. My name is Brittany Bruce, and I'm Special Projects Coordinator with the Marsh University Research Corporation, um, as well as Logistics Coordinator for the Alliance for the Economic Development of Southern West Virginia. Um, and today we're excited um, to have a um, dynamic a lineup of speakers joining us to talk about agriculture farmers markets um, in our state um, so before we get started i just wanted to provide a couple little housekeeping um, items so we want you to be a part of our conversation today um, so please feel free to submit any questions to our um, to our speakers um, via the chat function right here in microsoft teams or you can email me at brittany.bruce at marshall.edu as well um, and so to start off our program today, I just wanted to share a little bit about the, um, the Alliance. So the Alliance is an education collaborative that's made up of 10 higher education institutions in Southern West Virginia. Um, so those institutions are listed on the screen, but I'm going to go ahead and read those out as well. So we have Bluefield State College, Bridge Valley Community and Technical College, Concord University, Marshall University, Mount West Community and Technical College, New River Community and Technical College, Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College, West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, West Virginia State University, and West Virginia University Institute of Technology. So if you look at a map, um, the Alliance covers Mason, Webster, Clay County down. Um, we have a 21 county footprint and we represent 30,000 students. The Alliance is really project-based, results-driven. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and just talk a little bit about how our 40 Top series got started. So this series started um, last year during COVID as a way to still um, connect our residents with West Virginia leaders and experts. And during this time, we've had more than uh, 2,800 West Virginians participate statewide. Um, we've had 20 plus segments of uh, powerful programming. Um, we have had 50 plus experts um, participate in roundtable discussions as well as interviews. Um, and if you um, would like to check out any of our past sessions, those are all available on our website at marshall.edu slash AEDSWV. And if there's a topic that you would like to see discussed on a future 40 talk, please email us at wvsolutions at marshall.edu. We'd love to have any, any additional suggestions. Um, and now I just wanna talk about a few of the um, projects of the Alliance. So we have our Small Communities Big Solutions Conference that my colleague Sarah will talk a little bit about here in a few minutes. Um, and then we have um, our Power of Performance Awards. As well as, as well as our uh, West Virginia Solution Seeker Student Leadership Conference. Um, and this conference, um, we started this last year, and this was open to high school juniors, seniors, as well as college and training students. Um, and this was a one day virtual conference where students um, participated, learned a little bit about resources and opportunities available in our state. Um, and we're excited to have this conference again in April 2022. Um, and then we also gave away a couple student scholarships um, of $250 um, to students who are show, show some um, leadership qualities and are really creating positive change in their community or maybe their school or just their state. Um, so we were excited to get be able to give those away this year. Um, and then we also have four working groups in the Alliance. We have entrepreneurship, tourism, workforce um, and addiction and recovery. And within the addiction and recovery, we have our Western Collegiate Recovery Network. Um, and this is really um, a program that provides support services to students, faculty and staff that are in recovery, seeking recovery, or maybe just impacted by someone else's use. Um, and that is actively on seven campuses and universities in Southern West Virginia. And we also partner with many other organizations and institutions statewide. And so here is our Power of Performance um, Awards. And the nomination process is now open. Um, and so if you know an individual or an employer or an organization 
um, that is doing something remarkable in Southern West Virginia, that we encourage you to nominate them for this award. Um, we give out two awards um, within three different categories. So we have revitalizing communities, changing lives, and putting people to work. Um, so if you want to head over to our website at wvsolutions.net, um, the nomination form is there. It's really quick, takes about five minutes to complete. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to my colleague Sarah to talk a little bit more about the Small Communities Big Solutions Conference. Thanks so much, Brittany, and that was a great rundown for the Alliance. We're pretty proud of our Higher Education Collaborative taking on various projects. And one of the signature projects that we do every year is Small Communities Big Solutions Conference, and it's November, please save the date, November 15th through the 18th. It will be virtual. Last year, we had 80 speakers, jam-packed programming throughout the week. And uh, we had uh, state and national speakers, and we are busy putting together a powerful program for you again this year. Agriculture will be visited this year and during our conference. And so we'll be working with the commissioner's office and his team, as well as other experts to um, pull something together that is, uh, is top notch. So please save the date. We hope to see you there. And uh, without further ado, let's get our program started today. I'm really excited about this. My, myself, grew up in Putnam County. I had Aunt Virgie and she owned Virgie's Payne's Produce in Winfield. And I remember picking green beans and canning green beans with my grandma and just the joy and how much I learned as a child working on, on the farm and, and, and gardening and canning. And, um, and obviously the COVID pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has presented some challenges along the way. And we were um, very um, honored to have our state agriculture commissioner join us about this time last year when the 40 top was really um, starting to, to come online and he shared his concerns and uh, information about our state's uh, food supply chain. And it was just a wonderful, very interactive program. A wealth of knowledge was share shared. And so we wanted to do it again and we wanted to expand it to a, to a panel. So very excited about today. And uh, without further ado, I get the honor to introduce our first speaker, which is the West Virginia State Agriculture Commissioner, Kent Leonhardt. And um, the commissioner is no stranger to hard work. He has served the United States Ar uh, Marine Corps for 20 years, and he is also a longtime farmer. Um, I believe his farm is Mon in Monongalia Ca uh, County. He, it's still operational today. It's th like 380 plus acres. That's pretty impressive. And uh, and if that wasn't enough, he, as agriculture commissioner, he and his state at state staff travel uh, the mountain state, meeting with farmers, um, doing very important testing, and I'll let him share more about the day in and day out operations. But he has a fabulous team; they're very accessible, and uh, I believe that they're doing a great job. So, commissioner, thank you so much for joining us today on forty top and uh, we, we would love to hear from you. You know, despite technical challenges, you know, we all saw a lot of challenges over the last uh, over the last year and the Department of Agriculture was no uh, was no different. And, and I've got to give a shout out and, uh, you know, one of my team members, uh, division directors you heard from, you know, covering very well for me was Casey Bowden and her team did a great job during this, uh, during the pandemic year, helping coordinate an awful lot of things, but I've got to give the department credit. They, uh, they kept working right through the whole pandemic. You know, we didn't have to dump any milk, uh, like other state raw milk, like other states did. In fact, I worked with the governor's office and we brought more raw milk in so that we could get it onto the grocery store shelves. Uh, we ended up increasing our meat inspection. So our meat supplies, uh, weren't, uh, you know, we got strained. Our, our local meat processing facilities were strained, but we still kept more meat on the shelves than our surrounding states. 
So a lot of work was done by a lot of great folks out in the field, and I'm very proud of them. And I give a every chance I get publicly to thank them for what they did because you know our food system, as we talked about uh, last year on the top 40, was is a very fragile system, and we take for granted eating from a safe, affordable, and abundant food supply. But then when something happens happens it comes along uh, and that chain gets broken and we saw it again recently you know some fears are uh, cropping up with the uh, cyber attack on the largest meat processing uh, company around the world so uh, we're okay in West Virginia we're doing good uh, but we want to make sure that we stay vigilant on everything that we're doing uh, and it's very uh, it's very challenging so uh, the folks out there in the field they're the workhorses they're doing a, a, a marvelous job. But, uh, well, as we moved along, but even during this time frame, you know, we, we kept things going. We published a farmer's market vendor guide and provided ongoing technical assistance to everybody, to as many folks as we could. We published a COVID-19 impact guidance for farmers markets so we could keep the farmers markets open. And we had a lot of lessons learned during that time uh, and that we were able to translate into the legislative process this last legislative session, actually turning more and more market farmer market authority over to the Department of Agriculture so that we could have a single voice so that a farmer could go from market to market in different counties and understand what was going on and not have to apply to different rules in different places. So we're trying to make those things easier so that our farmers can expand their markets uh, within the state. Uh, we published a local food guide, uh, and that's where we know what uh, local foods were available. Uh, this is all very dynamic and it's changing, and we're working very hard on uh, getting that word out to everybody on what the uh, what's available to folks. You know, we all know that the shorter the food supply chain is from growing to consumption, the safer it is. And we want to make sure that we keep that chain. You know, we all, the most recent outbreak was the romaine lettuce out in, in, in California. And, uh, you know, that, you know, fortunately, there's good uh, Food Safety Modernization Act that can do a, uh, a link back to where the source of the infection was. But our whole goal is to reduce those infections and to keep our citizens safe. And that's part of what the Department of Agriculture does. We're a regulatory agency, but we're also here to help the farmer to make sure that when they sell a product, it's wholesome and safe to the consumer at the same time. And we've tried to streamline those and we're here to actually educate before we actually regulate, even though a lot of the regulations come from the federal government. And there's not, that's nothing we can do about that, but we wanna make sure that we're helping uh, our farmers meet those regulations as need as need be. Uh, since I mentioned dairy and not dumping milk, I've got to make a invite everybody to Dairy Night at the Power Park in Charleston, June 17th. The first pitch is going to be at 7 p.m. It's going to be a lot of activities to include cow milking and everything else. It'd be a great family night. But June is dairy month, so we're promoting our, our dairy products in the state. So I want to want to make sure we know about that. But also during this time, we put out 28 homesteading series, much like you're doing here, uh, educating the public on various topics of interest. And I'm and Casey, I know she's listening, and I'm going to ask her to put up on the team schedules the link to those series, so people can go down, scroll down, and and see what topics might be of interest to them. And they can go ahead and view those topics because there are way more than I can cover here uh, in this short period of time. Uh, Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, I was asked to speak about that a little bit. Uh, it's going to launch a little bit later than usual this year, but it's going to happen. We've had some uh, national technical difficulties. We're not the only state having that. We're working through that, and we hope to have uh, that program launched very soon. Uh, every year we've, we've ex asked for an expansion of funds uh, and this year we did get a little bit so the, the vouchers are going to go up from 28 to 30 dollars and they're in very small dollar increments because you're not allowed to get change back in that so the seniors love using 
multiple markets and giving them extra trips. So $2 might not sound like a lot, but that might be two more trips to the farmer's market for a senior. And that's good for the senior. And that's also good for West Virginia farmers. Um, that's good stuff. And we know we want to see improvements in the program. And fortunately, I sit on a national level uh, with this uh, as a member of the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. And uh, this coming weekend, I'll take over as president of the Southern Association of State Departments of Agriculture. So we'll be making sure that's a, a topic of issue to go to the national level to make these programs more flexible and easier to use. And uh, uh, for the citizens, not only of West Virginia, but nationally as well. SNAP Stretch, that's administered by DHHR. It's been a great program. Uh, during the COVID, uh, SNAP Stretch is also administered by them. You have to apply to, the seniors have to apply for it. But the good news is, I talked with the governor last year, they went through the SNAP Stretch money very early on, and it was worked through the West Virginia Farm Food and Farm Coalition. We were able to get from the governor another hundred thousand dollars, and that was all consumed and used by the uh, by the farmers. Uh, how many people did we have participate here? We had thirty-eight markets and twenty-five counties participated in the program. Uh, more than thirteen thousand residents. Uh, Ten and a half percent of the program participants were seniors. Fifty-eight percent were families with children, and thirty-one percent were single adults. Not all foods are eligible to receive SNAP, but if you use SNAP Stretch, you can go on to meat, dairy, and eggs as well. So that's a good thing. SNAP is normally for fresh fruits and vegetables. SNAP Stretch allows you to go a little bit further. Uh, uh, we submitted an application through Commerce, uh, West Virginia Commerce, Division of Commerce for another $200,000 to support that program. And hopefully that will come through. Uh, farm farm bill. Uh, we combined a lot of our chapter 19, which is what regulates the Department of Agriculture into one bill, made it easier for the legislature rather than tracking 12 bills, they tracked one bill. Uh, so we reduced the paperwork and increased the efficiency of government, but we got a lot of great things done uh, during that time. Uh, the Fresh Food Act was allowed which requires state agencies to buy 5% from West Virginia producers. And we, we expanded that to include dairy during, and dairy products uh, during the legislative session. Farmers market rules are being updated. Many clarifications were made during the legislative session. And so everybody that's involved with farmers markets should be seeing all that very soon. West Virginia grown, and I'll wrap up with that. I'm very proud of this program. We relaunched it about four years ago. It's doing great. In the past year, we increased membership of West Virginia Grown by 30%. And we did that during a pandemic. And we did it without additional state tax dollars. So that's great. That's that's good government. That's good, that's good for the citizens. And my staff is telling me, and I hope they're right that we're projecting a 40% increase in the next year of West Virginia Grown. So let's, let's see if we can all work together and beat that 40% and get it to around 45 or 50% increase. But again, I go around the state, I encourage the people to get to know their farmer. That's how you know your food. And I encourage people to keep that supply chain short, buy from a West Virginia farmer. And if I go into a group and people say the farmer's markets are too expensive and stuff, I'll ask the audience and I'll say, has anybody here bought a head of lettuce at a grocery store and not finished it? And invariably every hand will go up. And I say, well, maybe if you bought the head of lettuce from a West Virginia farmer that wasn't two weeks old when it hit the shelf and you got to finish, maybe you didn't pay too much for that product. Not to mention the increased nutritional value. So that's my last uh, line on that. And uh, I'll turn it back over to, uh, Sarah Brittany, and uh, I'll stand ready for questions whenever that time comes. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And we do have a few questions coming in. And just a reminder, if you have a question, if you want to be part of today's conversation, you can write your uh, question in the chat section and we'd be happy to try to get to them today. So I'll turn it back over to Brittany, who will introduce um, our next speaker. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, our next speaker today is Erica Gallimore, and she is project coordinator with the West Virginia Farm Farmers Market Association. So Erica, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. I'm going to pull up your PowerPoint presentation here. Thanks, Brittany. I am um, I'm Erica Gallimore. I am the uh, currently the development manager now for the West Virginia Farmers Market Association. It's a recent change uh, in my job title, so um, I won't hold that against you, Brittany. Um, I am here today to talk about uh, my association and uh, the opportunities and resources that we have for farmers markets and producers in 2021, uh, and some of the things that uh, we've found as a result of the pandemic. So um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we have several member services uh, that are not just for um, folks that are current members, but for everyone in the state uh, can participate and use. And I'm going to talk about those. I'm going to talk a little bit about the results of our 2020 farmers market census, which we do every year at the end of the season to find out how our markets did for the for that previous season. And I'm going to talk about the resources that we have right now that uh, you all can take advantage of, or you can um, tell the farmers across the state that we have available right now. So right now, um, you can sign up to be a member with us and register your farmer's market or farm with USDA the West Virginia Department of Agriculture and Farm Fresh WV all in one really quick and easy application on our website. We also offer virtual marketing upon request. You can share with us your events, your stories, your jobs, anything that you want us to share. And we can share that through our social media and our newsletter. Um, we also uh, are working on creating events pages um, where uh, folks can ask for donations. Um, we can do, um, we have toolkits and one-on-one -on -one coaching with our expert board members uh, who are volunteers for us. Um, they're very active and very willing to uh, help with anything that they, that you might need um, that relates to farmers markets, advocacy within your community and building up your uh, farm business or just regular business that you want to get started at the farmers market. Uh, we have a couple of toolkits that are available online through our resource library, which you can find on our website, which is wvfarmers.org. Um, the first one is a farmer's market planning toolkit. It is a three-part toolkit that includes a bonus uh, slideshow that shows you exactly how to start a farmer's market. That planning toolkit includes how to market to your market, how to uh, manage the financial parts and to structure your farmer's market. And it also includes a toolkit on vendor recruitment and retention. Other uh, things that are available in the resource library include some toolkits from other state associations, uh, printable promotional materials for SNAP. We also have some, if uh, anyone would like them. We also have COVID uh, promotional materials that can be printed. Um, we have a Power of Produce uh, Pop Club toolkit, which is for kids. Uh, if anyone's familiar with that program, that is a youth program for kids 5 to 12 who, um, when they come to the farmer's market, it helps encourage them to participate but also eat more healthy vegetables because, you know, kids don't necessarily like to do that, but that pop club really makes it fun for them. We also have a, a program uh, or a, I guess we have a, a friendship collaboration with Dyer Insurance. Uh, 
out of Clarksburg to um, have an insurance plan that's catered specifically for farmers markets and vendors. So if you get in contact with us for any of these things, I can point you in the right direction. And of course, available upon request, we have customizable data collection and record keeping toolkits and any marketing materials that you may want. Uh, as a member of the association, you get to use the Farmers Market Association branding package and my wonderful expertise as a graphic designer to make you beautiful signs or uh, stickers or anything that you might want. Uh, we have the, the capability to do that for our members. And coming soon, we are uh, working with a couple of agencies to try to do some labeling and marketing branding services. Um, we have one poultry processing unit currently active and ready to use in Charleston, West Virginia. We are trying to get the second one up and running so we can get it out to Kaiser. Uh, there have been a few technical difficulties on that, but we're we're working on it, hopefully in time for the processing season. As it, uh, I know it's uh, the clock's ticking on that one. We've got a lot of poultry already ready. Um, we also are working on a microprocessing pilot program for house recipes with the WVU Center for Resilient Communities. Uh, that is currently with five farmers markets and we are expanding that program, hopefully to a, a statewide initiative soon. Um, we are looking at healthy food initiatives, including pharmacy, kids clubs and senior programs for the future. And we are currently working with several agencies and you should see these coming up very soon, most likely by the end of the week. We have some workshops and training events that are producer focused to get the education to the producers uh, as best as we can. And of course, as always, if there's anything that we're missing and you would like us to do as an association, we're here to help and you just let us know what it is that we're missing and you'd like to see. So just a quick recap. Uh, I have just a couple slides on the 2020 census. Um, the first one is a really big number. Uh, $17 million. That is how much money was reported last year in farmers market sales, which means that there's a very good chance that it was much, much higher than this. Uh, we estimate that it was at least double that last year in sales just through farmers markets and on farm sales last year alone. That is tremendous. Go ahead to the next slide. We estimated that each week a customer uh, the customers that came to a farmer's market were 19,533 individual uh, people that shopped at a farmer's market last year. That's almost three times the amount that we saw from uh, 2019. And the customers spent on average $14.74 each time they visited a West Virginia farmer's market last year. So right now we have some opportunities for farmers markets this year um, and uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, thanks to our partners at Claude Worthington Benedum Foundation, we have funding available to support uh, communications and e-commerce platforms. We also have um, we, we no longer have any stipends available for farmers market managers to develop the rapid market assessments, but we are open to including more farmers markets in our peer network to make this more uh, a more um, robust program. These rapid market assessments are going to be for the markets and we're going to cater them for the individual markets as needed as best as we can. So as we are developing these, the more input, the better. Uh, we also have some mini grants to support sanitation stations. Um, we are in the process of getting more funding for that. Uh, so um, if your farmer's market or on farm market needs some kind of portable wash station or something like that uh, to help uh, provide sampling or um, just to be more COVID conscious, let me know and I will um, try to get you in on 
the list to get one of those sanitation stations. And uh, this is me. I am Erica Gallimore. Once again, I'm the development manager for the West Virginia Farmers Market Association. Uh, you can email me at erica at wvfarmers.org or uh, call me and leave me a message on that first number or just call or text the second number. And that's all I have. So I'll let you have it, Brittany. Great, Erica. Thanks so much. We really appreciate that overview um, of some of the resources that are available. Um, next up, we have Matthew Thompson, and he is Director, Community Placemaking and Special Projects for the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition. Good morning, Matthew. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to you. Um, so I want to thank the commissioner for already giving a great shout out to Snap Stretch. Um, Snap Stretch is a program that increase, increases the buying power for SNAP recipients in West Virginia. Um, last year, COVID, we saw a huge turnout for participation in this program um, as many folks were, were looking to shop um, with, with a shorter um, supply chain, feeling safer with the products they were buying from West Virginia farmers, um, having opportunities to go to outdoor spaces or do curbside pickup of products, um, all made possible by the people on this call who support our farmers every day. Um, I wanted to sort of take today's time to sort of give an update on the program this year um, and just sort of direct folks how to um, find a snap stretch market or participate in the program. And so to be eligible, you can be a farmer's market, a roadside farm stand, or a local um, food retailer. Um, and you can visit um, snapstretch.com um, to learn more. You must already be accepting SNAP. And if you do not accept SNAP currently, um, we can help you through that process, process as it can be burdensome um, for some folks um, to apply um, to accept SNAP. But, um, but once you can, um, the, the process is very simple to do SNAP Stretch. Um, we have great partnerships with WVU Extension to get marketing materials to your site um, and to help you implement the program. Um, SNAP Stretch, we've seen um, so many great testimonials um, from families who said if it wasn't for the program, they may go hungry um, throughout the year. Uh, many folks use this as an opportunity to purchase more products to then can for, for the later winter months um, and just make their dollars um, go even further. Um, so regular adults, um, we they get a one-to-one -one match on their SNAP EBT um, purchases. So they'll swipe typically swipe their SNAP card like they would a debit card um, and say they get $20 of SNAP EBT. That regular adult gets $20 more to shop. Uh, if they're a child or a senior over 60, they get an additional match. Um, seniors do not have to sign up for the program. It's an automatic um, match when they come and shop. Um, and they're not asked to show an ID or anything like that um, for the program. Um, and then last year, we were able to open up the program to meet eggs and dairy. Um, we are back under federal funding, which only allows the program to match fruits and vegetable purchases. Um, but as the commissioner was mentioning with um, the money we're hoping to get from the Department of Commerce, um, that would open it back up to meat, eggs and dairy, which is something that was new for the pandemic in response to the pandemic that was super successful um, and people were very happy with. Um, so again, the, pr the program is, is pretty straightforward in terms of shopping, uh, folks coming out using their SNAP EBT card at these sites. Um, getting the extra match. Um, when doing this, we're, we're encouraging folks to shop local and keep those dollars in state versus shopping at a Walmart or a big, big box chain store that takes the money out of state. Um, so last year, we're actually able to boast that Snap Stretch was able to capture half a million dollars within our local food economy um, that went right back to farmers um, and the producers in the state participating in the program. Um, I'll put my contact information in the chat box, but for sort of any basic information on the program, you can go to snapstretch.com. We, we currently have um, over 30 sites in more than 25 counties across the state. Um, so there is a listing of all those on the website if you are a consumer. And if you are a 
retailer or farmer's market, roadside stand farmer who wants to participate. Um, again, there's information on how to sign up, but also take a look at look at the list and the maps and see, you know, where we don't have sites. Um, and that might create great opportunities for you um, to help, you know, fill those gaps and for us to reach even more SNAP recipients um, in the future. Um, one other uh, resource that we have available um, that you can find these sites is farmfreshwv.com, um, which is something Erica also um, mentioned. So farmfreshwv.com is sort of a clearinghouse of all things, farmers markets, farms, agritourism, um, and other um, farm-based businesses in the state. It started as a, as a sort of a big marketing push um, to shop local and shop at farmers markets. And the Food Farm Coalition is maintaining that site. Um, and there's lots of functions available on there um, that I still think are untapped. So if you go to farmfreshwv.com, um, you can search for, for these different sites and businesses. But also if, if you're someone who operates a business or, or farmer's market in the state and want to collaborate um, and use, use those um, resources even more, um, I'd, be, I'd be very happy to talk to you about that. We do release um, blog posts on Fridays called Farm Fresh Fridays, um, where folks who are on that site um, get a shout out and get a special blog written by our communications um, coordinator. Um, so I'll, I'll post those links in our uh, in the chat box um, for you all to visit. And I'll also include my um, email address um, I'll, be, I'll be happy to talk to anyone about any of these opportunities and see how we can collaborate on projects in the future. And I just want to thank you all for giving me the, the time to, to speak this morning to everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, much Matthew. We really appreciate that update on SNAP stretch benefit. Um, at, um, I'll make sure to send around these resources too via email. Um, Erica's PowerPoint and some of those resources that you had mentioned, uh, Matthew, as well. I think Sarah's dropped a couple of those links in the chat. Um, so next we have um, Tommy Ravis, and she is um, owner of TL Fruits and Vegetables as well as TL Soaps. Good morning, Tommy. We're glad that you're here with us to this morning. Thank you very much. Um, I was asked to talk about two things. One is about my farm and how we got started farming. Um, so my name is Tommy Lou Rafus, and we started farming in 2011. Um, my husband Richard and I moved to West Virginia in 2010, and we started growing tomatoes. We had asparagus and a couple of other crops, and pretty soon we were selling them through an online farmer's market. Eventually, we started going to farmer's markets. Um, we ended up going to about three a week. Um, on top of doing the online farmers market. Um, so we're a woman owned and a women run farmers um, farm here. It's a small farm, but the women who work for me are anywhere from, I don't know, 50, 55 to 88 years old. And so we're an older workforce. Most of the women that work for me are professionals who have retired and they're just looking for something else to do. So they come out and help me grow fruits and vegetables. Um, one of the things that we believe um, at our farm and we try to share with others is that food is medicine. And we believe that um, people should eat the very best that they possibly can. Um, so buying local and buying fresh is our motivation for growing fruits and vegetables. The other thing that we try to do at our farm is to be sustainable and to be innovative. And what I mean by that is we have recaptured all of our water from all of our structures. So we have four high tunnels and we have a large house with a big rooftop and a barn. And we collect all of that water um, through French drains and then it goes down under the ground into holding tanks. And at this point, we have seven underground tanks. And then we also use solar energy at our farm. We're 100% solar energy. Um, we have 83 solar panels. And that takes care of all of our pumps and all of our electrical needs for the house and the farm. We also use geothermal energy. 
and we do that to help regulate the temperature inside of the high tunnel. And the last form of innovative energy that we use that's sustainable is we have a wind turbine. And of course that helps during the winter months when it's really windy up on the hillside that we're on and when we don't get quite as much um, sun power. So those are the things that we do um, on our farm. The second thing that I was asked to talk to you about is how my farm has coped with COVID over the last year. And it has been interesting. Um, one of the first things that we did in January um, 2020 was we started, of course, like everyone else, beginning to get alerted to COVID. And we began to be concerned um, our workforce obviously are old and the people that live with us are old as well. We had some aging parents that lived with some of our farmers, um, employees, and then we had some health concerns with some of these people. So we decided that we would ask all of our employees, which are three women, um, to stay home for four weeks. So in January, we sent everybody home for four weeks. Well, we kind of waited to see what was going to happen with COVID. Nobody was really sure. And I went ahead and paid um, the employees so that nobody would be out of money. And then in February, we invited everyone back to the farm and we social distanced and we discussed how are we going to get through this um, COVID-19 pandemic together safely. And so we decided that we would make a commitment to one another. And we decided that we would all wear N95 masks if we went out. Um, we would shop online or go to stores where we could have delivery pickup. Um, we would curtail or avoid any um, activities where we had large groups. And um, so we all agreed that we would work on this together. And one of our employees, when she went home and discussed it with her husband, he was not quite so sure about that. And so he wasn't wanting to social distance. He wasn't quite sure that COVID was gonna be as bad as it was. And so we asked her not to come back to the farm, that we wanted to maintain um, a safe environment for our employees, as well as for ourselves. Um, about six weeks later, the employee came back. They decided that COVID was quite a scare and something to be worried about. And so as a team, we continued to grow produce. Um, we grow all year long. So we were having customers during the winter months, the spring, the fall. And the way we sold our produce was through a CSA. So rather than going to farmers markets, um, we were packaging up our fruits and vegetables and delivering it. And the way we did that is we asked our customers to set out a cooler and that way we didn't have any one-on-one um, -on -one interaction with anyone. Um, instead, what I would do is write a letter, a CSA letter to my customers every week to let them know what was going on in the farm, um, let them know about who was getting vaccinated and how we were getting vaccinated and sharing that information so they could get vaccinated. Um, and then I would tell them what produce was available so they could pick and choose what they wanted in their bag. The way the customers would pay me um, was through PayPal or Venmo. Sometimes they would leave cash or a check in the cooler for me. But honestly, I didn't see my customers for the whole year. It was all um, without any interaction other than this email back and forth. What happened was um, word of mouth spread and my customer base increased and increased um, to double what I had expected. And we actually have a waiting list of quite a few people wanting to get on the CSA list. I probably have 18 customers I've never even met. Um, I just have talked to them either by text messaging or by email. Sometimes people find out about me from Facebook postings or Instagram. Um, but it's been a very interesting year um, having these customers that I haven't met. Although I will say because of the emails back and forth and because of the text messaging, I actually think I know my customers better and I know they know me better than I did when I was at a farmer's market. Um, you know, my letters tend to go on probably longer than they need to be, but I tell them about what we're doing on the farm and what we're growing. 
and of course they email back and tell me about their family and what they're doing. So it's been a really interesting year. Um, above and beyond the CSA, I also sell produce to a couple of stores in town. Again, I deliver it um, without having to interact with anybody. Um, I also participated in two programs that took place in Greenbrier County. Um, one was that our senior centers weren't able to open up and feed the seniors like they had in the past. So a local attorney um, found some funding and she put together and organized a program where she bought local produce from farmers and prepared boxes of fresh produce and then they delivered it to the homes where these seniors lived and that was a really great program and I was happy to participate in that. Other than that, we also had a pharmacy program spelled F-A-R-M-A-C-Y and again, they bought local produce. Um, they targeted diabetic patients. I think they had 30 and those patients, I believe, had to go to the clinic or to their doctor's office to pick up their produce and that was run through the WVU Extension Office. Um, I participated in a couple of kids' pop-up markets um, at schools and the kids all wore masks, we all wore masks and um, I found it really interesting what kids would choose and pick for their vegetables. Um, FYI collard greens is all the phase right now. Apparently it's the size of the leaf that's pretty exciting. Um, but collard greens, strawberries obviously, microgreens were exciting, carrots, um, tomato plants, um, asparagus, it, it was interesting what kids would choose to take home. Um, other than that, um, one other thing that they asked me to talk about was other things that we have going on and we have a demonstration garden, it's called Let's Grow Together and that's located in Lewisburg, West Virginia at Montwell Commons and we invite the community to come in and to learn. Every Saturday I teach a lesson on a different gardening technique and during COVID that was a little um, uh, much of a struggle because you didn't want to invite too many people in um, but we opened it up to people that wore masks and we had quite a few of the students from WVSOM that came and we grew vegetables and fruits together at the demonstration garden. That was that was pretty exciting. So I appreciate being a part of this and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Tommy. It was really great to, to hear the ways that you were able to stay operational during COVID. That, that was that's really awesome. Um, so we did have a couple some uh, questions submitted and just a reminder, if you have a question for any of our speakers today, please feel free to drop that in the chat. Um, so the first question that I have um, that was submitted is, let me see here, um, for Matthew, um, with the, um, the PEBT cards that um, families are receiving for their children, um, it, are they able to use, utilize that for the SNAP stretch benefit as well or? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because as soon as I was done, I was like, I did not touch on PBT and it's something you had sent previously. <laughs> yes, we do recognize PEBT um, as, as SNAP EBT. And so that actually is one of the reasons as well. Last year really blew up so much and we, we did require um, the Department of Ag and the commissioner's support with, with additional funding was that we had all these new, new participants with the PBT cards who previously would not have participated. So this year again with the PBT cards being available they can absolutely use those at participating sites great thank you so much for that um and then also have a um question for the commissioner um if he's still on with us i think he is um so with the state and local covid funding um is there funding carved out for the agriculture sector or is it lumped in with small business funding Right now, they're still uh, the legislature is still discussing how they're going to work this, and the governor's office on how that's going to be working out. I imagine a lot of it, since these are businesses and it's an agribusiness, mm -hmm. I imagine it's going to end up being uh, lumped in together with with everybody out. But obviously, I'm going to be in there uh, swinging and pitching for the uh, 
for the farmer uh, in some of that funding. So we're working with a few folks on that as well. Uh, but that new funding has yet to come out. The other dollars are already accounted for, and that was all separated. Uh, the new dollars is what I'm talking about now. Okay. And I also have another one for you, Commissioner, as well. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge, challenge and opportunity for agriculture moving forward? Well, one of the biggest challenges that I've seen all along is that you know, we have a lot of people in agriculture doing things that the way their father did it, their grandfather and their great grandfather did it. And, uh, you know, agriculture is evolving. And, and, you know, the challenge that I talked about earlier was shortening that supply chain and making sure it's a safe and affordable and abundant for the citizens of West Virginia. So we got to make sure that our supply chain is uh, not as fragile as we've seen it. So that's one of the, the things that we're really working on. But you also have to remember, you have a lot of citizens and farmers in the state that want to do things the old way. So the challenge is how do you keep the old way of doing business and usher in the new? And that's one of the biggest challenges that we have at the department. And I, I think we're going to continue to have that going forward. But it's an education process, just like what you're doing here, just like our homesteading series, uh, how we educate the public. You know, and farming also is a, hard, a lot of hard work. And, uh, you know, even the new ways of doing agriculture is hard work. And uh, the average age of a farmer in West Virginia is, is keep, continues to creep. And that's not just in West Virginia, that's a national trend. So we have to make, find some way to entice the young folks in. I'm very proud of our FFA and 4 H programs in the state. Uh, we're hitting record numbers, even with a declining state population. That's a good sign that there's a bright future for agriculture uh, in West Virginia in the future. So we have to just keep promoting, you know, the benefits of eating locally. The pharmacy programs are expanding that Tommy talked about. Uh, great for her and the way she's been able to work with that down there. Uh, we've got them up in the northern part of the state. We've got them all over the state actually starting to flourish. And we're actually started, I've been working with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Marsh, and we've been discussing how do we make sure that we improve the nutrition to all citizens in West Virginia. So we should be seeing more on that as time goes on, but we're working on it. Great, thank you so much. Um, and this next question can really be open to all of our speakers today, so just feel free to, to chime in. Um, uh, the Alliance does a small business leader survey, and we saw an increase in businesses using e-commerce and social media. I know that Tommy mentioned that. Um, in your all's experience, what advancements are you seeing be, being made in regards to these two areas relating to agriculture? <laughs> Nobody wants to jump in on that one again. I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> okay. Um, I noticed that when I post a picture of something that we're harvesting, um, I get a lot of interest back from customers and um, they all want to know, how can I have some of that? How can I get some of that? Um, so I would say Facebook and Instagram have been a great promoter for my business. Um, I love the fact that they can pay me through PayPal and Venmo. I love the fact that I can um, drop things off at coolers or at different businesses and locations. Um, I, I think this online and um, access to everybody makes it great for produce growers, for someone like me. I'll give an example. Um, one time I had an overabundance of head lettuce and anybody that grows head lettuce knows that it doesn't have a long shelf life. And all it took was me to take a picture of it and say, who's interested and it was gone. I mean, it went really quick, really fast. So um, I love being able to promote my produce um, using technology. So um, that was one of the things, or one of the drivers in the association seeking funding for a technology fund. We saw an uptake in online farmers markets and online sales and more folks were interested in uh, t new technologies where in previous years they really weren't. So that's, um, we saw that as a result of the pandemic because people were trying to be more uh, socially distant and um, conservative about who they were around. 
Um, so, um, yeah, that that was uh, e-commerce went through the roof last year. <laughs> Thanks so much. Anybody else? This goes to show how I was just going to say it goes to show how important the whole broadband issue is for the state of West Virginia and our rural. I mean, it's how we bring back the small farm in West Virginia uh, so that they can, like Tommy said, connect with their customers. So, you know, we go out there and we promote that. And uh, every citizen really needs to get behind those initiatives and get get that last mile down to every uh, to everybody in West Virginia. You're going to see some great results economically once we do that. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's a great point to bring up, bring up as broadband. So thanks for, for adding that, Commissioner. Um, I also had another question for you, Commissioner. Um, can you discuss the food supply chain and are there any success stories linking farmers to companies or institutions or organizations? I know Tommy talked a little bit about her work with um, uh, uh, Western US SOM. Um, so is there any other stories that you know of, Commissioner, like that? Well, you know, just we talk about the food chain prior to the pandemic. Believe it or not, 30% of the food consumed nationally and the same held through in West Virginia was through restaurant. People ate out a lot. And what happened was there wasn't necessarily a shortage of food at the beginning stages of the pandemic, but it was a way it was packaged and processed. That was the problem. Um, the food was there, but people were gearing up to, I need so much packaged in bulk for a restaurant or this school or this institution, and I need so much individually wrapped for individual or family servings at the supermarkets. So when suddenly you had 30% of the population of the eating part going into the uh, grocery store, that's what caused the rush and the shortage in the grocery because they had not pre-planned their orders for that. Um, so the success story is the Tommy uh, raises of the uh, of the and the farmers markets of the state of West Virginia. I mean, we were already before COVID increasing the number of farmers markets in the state. The message and the word was getting out there, but the pandemic really hit the spot. So people started going to those markets. The challenges we had sometimes were with the regulations and understanding and who was in charge, whether you could sell meat at the farmers markets. Uh, we, we classed with some of the health departments. Uh, we worked it out. Uh, and I think, you know, we're in, we're in a much better place. So a success story is that the, the depth and breadth of products at farmers markets has increased tremendously. So it's more like going to a grocery store than, uh, than normal. Uh, the legislature also recognized uh, micro dairy. Uh, we were able to convince the legislature. So I believe you're going to see some more micro dairies coming online. Uh, you've got one in Greenbrier County now that is just making cheese curds. So we have a new dairy farm in, in Greenbrier County and they're making cheese curds. And some of that's going to some of the schools. So that's a West Virginia grown product that's going into the marketplace. Uh, West Virginia farmers have been very adaptive uh, to this whole thing, uh, and we need to give them all a shout out, and, and people need to go thank the West Virginia farmer for, for all the work that they've done uh, over the past uh, year. But you're going to see more success stories and lessons learned, and we're here at the department. Uh, we're available to help and work with anybody that's, that has a great idea or wants to do something. Uh, we'll work with you. And uh, along with our partners, you know, at WVU and Marshall University and the other and West Virginia State, these schools are doing some great work uh, as well, trying to improve the whole agricultural picture in the state of West Virginia. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. I did see there was a question in the chat um, for recommendations um, on technology platforms um, to help track sales and calculate taxes, et cetera. Um, Tommy, Eric, I saw you all have been responding. Do you want to add anything else to that question? I've used a couple of different platforms for um, different sales uh, types, not necessarily produce because I don't personally sell produce, but um, 
the uh, the square space or the square um, square dot com uh, is a free um, platform that's really great for startup businesses, um, and they offer uh, one um, web page per business that you can customize to uh, using your own branding and all of that. Um, that's really easy to use that if anybody wanted to have a quick tutorial, um, I can set up a time and show you guys how to use that. Um, another one uh, is uh, PayPal. Um, there, I have not used Shopify, but it's a really uh, great way to, it plugs in directly into your um, current website. Uh, there are um, there are if you have a WordPress website, there are a lot of different e-commerce websites that are e-commerce plugins that you can uh, add to your website to make sure that you have those shops available to your customers. Great, thanks so much. Um, and I did have another question. This will be our last question um, for our session today. Um, and I think uh, Matthew had to hop off. So if um, either the commissioner, or Erica, if you all can can answer this question, um, uh, do we have any data on the use of snap stretch by county? I believe we have that uh, that data. Uh, I don't have it right here, but I believe if you get hold of uh, the Food and Farm Coalition, they should be able to. Uh, provide that data. If not, give the Department of Agriculture a call and we'll see what we can do to, to get that to you. I do want to add one little thing real quick, and I know you had another question. We had a lot of uh, other activities that went on, like we didn't talk much about cottage foods on this, uh, but we've done a lot to expand the cottage food industry. That's where somebody has a great idea or a great recipe from their family. Uh, and they want to see if it will go in the marketplace. So we're seeing a lot of uh, successes. Uh, we we held a virtual town hall, not a virtual, a virtual uh, meeting with the state parks so that our cottage food industry people, jams, jellies, pickles, uh, mustards, relishes, peppers, uh, can, could sell as gift items into the state park goes. So we're doing those type of innovative things as well. and. With the cottage food bill that was passed in the legislature recently, we're seeing expansion. Uh, there'll be a lot of things. I'm going to put a plug in for the state fair and the West Virginia grown building at the at the Department of Ag building. There'll be a lot of great West Virginia grown products that are uh, that have been made by West Virginians, grown in West Virginia, uh, being sold there during the state fair uh, later in August. So I got to put a plug in for that. That all helps our farmers and our farmers markets. Great, thanks so much. Um, so actually that was the last question that I had. Um, I just wanna thank all of our speakers for taking the time to join us today for this 40 Top Virtual Series. What an informative session. I know that I've learned a lot today and I'm sure that our attendees were able to learn something new as well. Um, so just be sure to um, check our website for upcoming 40 Top Series. Um, and just thank you so much and everyone stay safe.